Today we'll be talking about seizures. I would like to start by classifying seizures. There are three classifications to consider. First, partial seizures. Secondly, generalized seizures. And thirdly, status epilepticus. With partial seizures, you have simple partial seizures and complex partial seizures. Simple partial seizures may present with motor, somatosensory, autonomic, and psychic components. Complex partial seizures may present with focal onset prior to alteration in consciousness, or it may present without focal onset prior to alteration in consciousness. The next is generalized seizures. With generalized seizures, we consider primary generalized non-convulsive seizure, which would include absence seizures. Then we have primary generalized convulsive seizures, which would include tonic-clonic, clonic, tonic, myoclonic, and atonic manifestations. The next class is status epilepticus. Status epilepticus may occur with convulsive generalized seizures. It may also occur with convulsive focal seizures, and it may occur with non-convulsive seizures, which would include the absence and the simple partial. Now, even though I previously stated that there are three classifications, I will include psychogenic seizure not as a classification, but as a type of seizure that should be considered. With psychogenic seizures, it is also known as pseudo-seizures or non-epileptic seizures. The characteristic features of a psychogenic seizure include out-of-phase tonic-clonic activity, forward pelvic thrusting, and voluntary eye movements away from the examiner. Now, before I proceed, I would like to cover some definitions and terms that are related to seizures. The first one is ictus. Ictus is the period of active season. The second one is epilepsy. Epilepsy is a condition of recurrent, unprovoked seizures. The third one is post-ictal. Post-ictal is the time from the termination of the seizure, but before getting back to baseline. The fourth is aura. Aura is a focal seizure and is defined by the area of the brain where the seizure originates. The fifth definition is partial seizure. Partial seizure is due to the abnormal firing of neurons in a limited area of the brain. Then we have simple partial. Simple partial seizures do not involve a change in mental status. The seventh is complex partial seizures. Complex partial seizures involve some degree of impaired consciousness and a larger area of brain involvement. Eighth, we have generalized seizures. Generalized seizure involves both sides of the brain. Generalized seizure may be tonic, clonic, tonic-clonic, or myoclonic with loss of consciousness. Generalized seizure may be absence seizure with a change in mentation, but no loss of postural tone. The ninth 
is status epilepticus. Status epilepticus can be defined as a seizure lasting for five minutes or more or recurring seizure activity without an interictal return to baseline. Number 10, refractory status. Refractory status epilepticus occurs when the seizure does not terminate after a benzodiazepine and a second anti-epileptic drug. Number 11, generalized convulsive status epilepticus. Generalized convulsive status epilepticus, abbreviated GCSE, is a medical emergency with mortality correlating with the seizure duration. And the last one is non-convulsive status epilepticus. Non-convulsive status epilepticus, abbreviated NCSE, is a medical challenge. With these patients, they continue to seize without any tonic-clonic action or physical manifestation that indicates that they are still seizing. Now let's go to the history. There are several things that should be kept in mind. Number one, when a patient comes in with seizure, try to obtain a good history from EMS or family members. Number two, what were the circumstances prior to the seizure? Number three, was there any history of trauma prior to or during the seizure? Number four, is there any history of seizure or other medical history, including brain surgery? Number five, is there any psychiatric history? Number six, is the patient on any medications such as anticoagulants? And number seven, is there any recent travel? Now let's look on the physical examination. Number one, get a set of vitals. A low grade fever may sometimes accompany an extended seizure. However, high fever may suggest infection. Number two, hypertension with bradycardia may be due to increased intracranial pressure and impending herniation. Number three, irregular heart rate or carotid brewery may suggest a stroke, which is a common cause of new onset seizure in the elderly. Number four, persistently dilated pupils after a seizure may suggest anticholinergic or sympathomimetic toxicity. Number five, post ictal confusion should resolve within an hour. If it does not, you should become concerned. And number six, look for head injury, soft tissue injuries, tongue laceration, shoulder dislocation, particularly posterior, and fractures, especially of the spine. Here are some key points to remember for the emergency provider caring for a seizure patient. Number one, non-compliance with anticonvulsants is the most common cause for ED presentation of recurrent seizures. Number two, seizures with metabolic causes are most commonly due to hypoglycemia and occur mainly in diabetics. Number three, patients on anticoagulants should be suspected of having intracranial bleed. Number four, both alcohol intoxication and withdrawal may induce seizures. Number five, cocaine may induce seizures. Number six, pregnancy can lower the seizure threshold and cause a seizure. Number seven, hyponatremia may result in seizures. Number eight, 
The EEG is the definitive test for diagnosing a seizure disorder. Number nine, lactic acidosis with wide anion gap is usually present but should resolve within an hour after the seizure ends. Number 10, neurocystocercosis and malaria both cause adult onset partial seizure in developing countries. Number 11, obtain a head CT on patients with new onset seizures. And number 12, remember long-acting paralytic agents are contraindicated if the patient needs intubation because it can mask generalized convulsive status epilepticus. Now let's look on the treatment for generalized seizures. Number one, provide oxygen and ensure the airway is open. If breathing is compromised, then do rapid sequence intubation using succinyl choline because it is very short acting. The only drawback with succinyl choline is renal failure. Number two, place the patient on cardiac monitor with pulse oximetry and capnography. Number three, intravenous access with normal saline is important. Avoid dextrose. However, if the seizure was due to hypoglycemia, dextrose and thiamine should be given. Number four, a non-contrast head CT is warranted if this is new onset seizures. Number five, administer intravenous lorazepam. It is regarded as the first line medication. The effect lasts up to 12 hours. Lorazepam is generally recommended at a dose of 0.1 mg per kg and may be administered up to 4 mg per dose and be repeated in 5 to 10 minutes if seizure activity is not terminated. Number six. In the event there is no IV access, intramuscular midazolam can be used because it is water soluble and rapidly absorbed. Now I want to repeat something that was previously stated concerning the patient who is actively seizing and is brought to the emergency department. Now the steps should be well known and one of the first things that should be done is a finger stick. And if the finger stick glucose test is less than 60 milligrams per DL, then IV dextrose should be administered. This is a class three recommendation. Assess the airway, the breathing, and the circulation. Obtain vital signs, monitor, pulse oximetry, and perform an electrocardiogram. Again, this is a class three recommendation. Administer first line drug, such as lorazepam, at a dose of four milligrams IV push over two minutes. This may be repeated. If lorazepam is not available, diazepam may be used at a dose of 10 milligrams IV push and the dosage is 0.15 milligrams per kg. This medication diazepam may be used rectally also, and it may be repeated. If lorazepam and diazepam are not available and you have midazolam and there's no IV, you can give midazolam IM if there's no IV access. However, if there is IV access, you can give it 10 milligrams IV push. While all aspects of seizures could not be presented in this short time, I have bundled the information that's relative to emergency intervention. It is important that you understand and know very well the steps 
that needs to be taken in managing the seizing patient. It is important to know the first line medication that will terminate the seizure. It is important to recognize non-convulsive status epilepticus, a medical condition that goes unnoticed by even the most experienced physician or PA. And it is important to terminate status epilepticus as the mortality parallels the duration of the seizure. Thanks for listening and I wish you well.